up at longer intervals, you want to make sure that you have the basics. You want to make sure you have flour. You want to make sure you have butter. Things that are non-perishable. Uh, that you things that you can freeze. Things that you can store in your pantry. Obviously, we're going to be buying perishable items. But once those run out, you want to have round, rounded meals even after that if you can't go to the grocery store. So that's why. I feel that this recipe works really, really well. Um, and as I stated in the recipe packet, which hopefully all of you have handy, um, if you don't, there was an email that was sent out that had that attachment by Maggie earlier. I think it was yesterday. There was a revision that was sent out. Um, this particular recipe utilizes things that you will typically have in your pantry and you'll have in your freezer. So for one, uh, you'll have flour, you'll have butter, um, you'll have, usually you'll have eggs. You might even have a chicken or chicken breasts that are in your freezer that you can just pull out and defrost. Um, once this whole thing is finished, you can actually freeze these pot pies and have them later. So if you do the individual ones, um, which you can make in small ramekins like this, or in our case, what we're gonna be using is these little loaf pans. This is a one pound loaf pan. And the reason they call it a one pound loaf pan is because if you fill this with water, you'll have one pound of water in it. So um, the ingredients that you have listed in your packet, they will make six one pound pound pot pies. That means that's six pounds of, of ingredients all together once you're finished. Now, if you want to do uh, smaller ones, as I said, you can use these smaller ramekins or you can put it all in one big vessel like this and just have a big family meal. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. You'll just alter your cooking time for this. Uh, you'll probably have it at a slightly smaller or lower temperature, like 325 in the oven. And this will bake a bit longer so that it has a chance to bake everything inside. Um, or you can do, you know, even kind of off sizes like this, which, you know, might yield perhaps three, two or three different pies. <laughs> also in our packet, we have some instructions to make this vegetarian, um, as well as, um, um, I think I did, Yes, a Thai curry version. So you could do a chicken Thai curry or a vegetarian Thai curry or just a plain vegetarian version, in which case you'll just be using um, no chicken. You'll be using uh, vegetable stock instead of chicken stock. And you might uh, toss in something like a roasted butternut squash instead of chicken in there. And you'll have an equal portion to the chicken um, and you'll have uh, a successful product at the end. So Mike. Yes. If you wanted to do a vegetarian version that had a protein in it, like beans or tofu, could you do that? Would that work? Yes. So you could do, I wouldn't do beans, but I would do like a firm tofu. Okay. Now with the firm tofu, you could actually cook it. We're going to cook our chicken, except without water. We'll just do, uh, you could just kind of toss it in some oil on, on it in a pan and kind of get some caramelization going. Uh -huh. And then you'll toss it in with the rest. So you could probably also, like I like to cube tofu and bake it and it gives us nice like meat. Yeah. So you can do that you can too. do that too. Yeah. Great. Um, so, uh, which raises a good point. Um, the chicken, once we put it, before we put it into the pot pies, we're gonna, we're gonna wanna almost completely cook that chicken. Um, because once it's in the oven, all we're doing is really heating it up and making sure that the crust is nice and cooked. So if you have some, if you have a, 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 a probe thermometer handy, you'll want to be getting your chicken pot pies at about 165, which is the safe zone for chicken. So after about 30 minutes, you'll start taking the temperature of those chicken pot pies. You'll just probe it in the center and see what the temperature is. 165 is where you want to go for the safe zone. So we're gonna be cooking our chicken to 160 internal temperature. 
and <coughs> then we'll be cubing it up and putting it right into the uh, to the mixture. Okay. Um, so um, when it comes to making sure you're stocked, think about what you need to eat in a month. Shop for a month. So stock your freezer, stock your pantry. Um, we're not buying the Holocaust. So you don't need to worry about that. But um, just buy enough that you can pull from the freezer, you can pull from the pantry, you have plenty of what you need. And in this case, what you're gonna need in your pantry, frozen vegetables. So we have frozen vegetables we're gonna be tossing in. This is um, a, a frozen veg a vegetable mix. So this one just includes uh, carrots and broccoli and, um, and cauliflower. And then I have some peas in here that I tossed in. And that's a pretty good mix for a chicken pot pie. You can obviously do whatever you like, even if you want to put fresh vegetables in there. If you want to put fresh broccoli, fresh um, uh, carrots and cauliflower, you'll want to blanch those up first. Just put them in some boiling water for about a minute to two minutes, and then and they'll be good to go right into your mixture. So these frozen ones are typically blanched before they're frozen. Mike, okay. does that mean asparagus would need to be blanched too? Um, it's a good idea. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good idea to blanch your asparagus very, very briefly. So you'll just want to toss it in some hot water for about 30 seconds. Okay. And also water boiling, boiling water. So you have boiling water for about 30 seconds. All right. Okay. So the first thing we're going to start with, before I actually, before I move on, anybody have any questions? Uh, iodized or kosher salt? Pardon me? Iodized or kosher salt? I always use kosher. Okay. Iodized salt is salt that has no minerality left in it. It's basically a flavorless mineral salt. Kosher salt is a light, flaky salt. And when you use, uh, sorry, yes, kosher salt is a light, flaky salt. Um, if you were uh, measuring it, measure for measure, you're actually going to end up using much more um, iodized salt than you would flaky salt because it's heavier, it's denser. <laughs> so if you're measuring, say, a teaspoon of each, you're going to get a much saltier flavor with iodized salt. What about sea salt? Sea salt's great too. You can use sea salt. So just a procedural question. If we're going to be blanching our vegetables, should people be putting water on now and getting it hot? Yes. So if you want to blanch your vegetables, get, get some water hot. You can do a shallow pan if you want to do it quickly and just cover it and steam it. Okay. So um, I wanted to mention also that it's not totally necessary for you all to follow along with me. If you want to just um, listen and not do what we're doing, that's perfectly fine. This is going to be a recording um, that you can access later. So we're going to be moving pretty quickly. And I know that uh, that can be challenging when some of the steps are new to you. So don't worry about it. You can always access this video later. Is that right, Maggie? Yeah. Okay. So let's move to pastry. Um, and we're going to be using all purpose flour. We're going to be doing a good quality butter. Now, the recipe calls for grating your butter. Grating your butter means that you don't have to use as much of your uh, hand um, to mix it in or a, a pastry cutter. You can actually just grate the butter into your flour, just toss it together, and then add your water but I already cut up some butter. Use a good quality butter and make sure it's cold. So like this kind of grater? Right, so if you're gonna grate it in, use a box grater like this. So use the larger holes and then you can just toss your butter with it, okay? Um, and I also wanna note that we here are doing a half recipe. So everything is gonna look a lot less <laughs> than what you're doing if you're doing a full recipe. So just keep in mind, we are doing a half recipe since we're only feeding ourselves, okay? Okay, so we've got our flour measured and hopefully all of you have your ingredients measured. 
And we're just going to add some salt to this. I'm just going to add a little bit of salt to that. And then I'm going to use some cold butter that's pre-measured. And I'm just going to toss it in, use my hands, and just kind of get it so I still have large chunks. And in case you haven't noticed, if you look at my camera right beneath, you can see the, the top view. I'm sure if you're looking at the Mike Jones camera, you can see me manipulating this. You're just saying my beautiful face if you're looking at my camera. <laughs> okay. Now, the good thing about a flaky pastry is you do not have to be absolutely thorough about combining. You want to make this a little chunkier than you would do with a regular pastry crust. So for me, that's about right. I'm looking at larger chunks. The butter is mixed in with the flour a little bit, but not much. If you're in a warm kitchen, you want to do this as quickly as you can. So what about using something like a pastry blender or a fork or something like that? A pastry blender is great, a fork is great. I use my hands because that's what chefs do. <laughs> All right, now I've got my water. This is chilled and it has about a teaspoon of lemon juice in it. The reason I put lemon juice in it is because typical butter does not have, it's not uh, cultured. Now in uh, Europe, they use cultured butter for pastry. So uh, cultured butter is a little more acidic and it makes the crust a little more tender. So I'm just going to mimic that cultured butter uh, by adding a little bit of lemon juice into my water. So you're just going to add a little bit at a time until you get a very dry dough. You don't want a wet dough. The more water you add, the tougher this crust will get. How much water? Best way. Yes. Best How job. much water? Um, so your recipe calls for four to six ounces for the full recipe. Okay, if you say so. And I, you don't want to add it all at once. You just want to add as much as you need to get it going. Now, when I tested this recipe, I used the full six ounces for the full recipe. Okay. And it really, it, it's it's more about feel. Yeah. And and sort of the, the quality that it. Has right than it is about quantity right so I've got a pretty dry dough here this is perfect okay. and I'm just gonna press it together can we see what it looks like right now just to get a sense of that yeah I'm pressing it together so you can see it so see we've got We've got a ball of dough that's fairly dry. This is actually a little bit on the wet side. That's all right. And then what we're going to do, and if you look at it, you can still see little bits of butter in it that aren't right. totally incorporated into the flour. Now, the reason we want little bits of butter in this are because we're going to roll that out, flatten it. We're going to do some book folds. And we're going to continue to flatten those globules of butter out until we get some nice big flakes. And that's the goal. Okay. So if you have some wrap, you want to use some clear saran wrap. So I mean, you barely work that. Right. You want to work quickly. The less you work it, the better. I'm going to flatten it out with the palm of my hand, and then, again, this is, a, this is a half recipe. You're going to end up with quite a bit more for yours. What I've made here, this is going to make about three one-pound pot pies. And incidentally, the reason I want to do one-pound pot pies instead of smaller ones is because uh, when you think about it, the pot pie has really quite a bit of a square meal in it already. So it has your protein and it has your vegetable, it has a starch, it has a sauce. 
So really all you need to do, um, well, all you need to serve in addition to a pot pie is maybe a toss salad, which we're gonna be doing as well later on. Okay, any questions? You good? Okay, now I'm gonna put this in the fridge. Ideally, we're gonna chill this for about an hour. We're gonna move on to some next steps and we're gonna come back to this when we're done with our next steps. It doesn't actually have to be strictly an hour. It could be 45 minutes. It could be an hour and a half. It's okay, but we don't wanna chill that overnight. If we chill it overnight, um, your crust is gonna suffer a bit. So the next day it's gonna be very, very hard. Um, you'll have to defrost it a bit. And when you defrost it or when you uh, uh, warm it up, there's a risk of the butter melting into the flour, which we don't want to see. Still, still catching up. <laughs> Haven't pressed the oh. dough yet. Okay, so anybody else behind like me? How are you guys doing? All good? All right, so we're gonna move on to uh, chicken. And I wanna talk about the versatility of a whole chicken. This is a, this is a big girl right here. Um, chickens come in different sizes. When you're choosing your chicken, it's always a good idea to go, go for natural chickens if you can. Um, now, Denis asked an interesting question earlier and that was, um, can you tell the quality of a chicken or the, um, whether or not it's a natural chicken by the color of it. And you really can't. If a chicken is, is pink, generally that means it's not natural. The more pink the chicken, the less natural it is. But that's not a rule. That's just generally the process of, uh, of adding uh, saline and that sort of stuff to the uh, to the flesh can cause the flesh to turn pink. But I have seen fresh chickens that are natural chickens that are uh, that are pink in some places and quite yellow in others. Uh, it's really not a hard and fast rule. Just trust your butcher if you can and buy chickens that are labeled as natural. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this up. Now, when I buy a whole chicken, what I get, generally speaking, I get about eight to 10 pieces. Plus I get the rib cage. And the rib cage is really valuable to me because then I can use that for stock later. So I get a lot of mileage out of one chicken. Um, if you buy, you know, all breasts or all uh, legs or whatever you want, you're going to be uh, forfeiting that versatility. So chickens are pretty easy to cut up. You want to use gravity to your advantage. So I'm going to pick it up by the leg like this. I'm going to take a nice sharp knife and I'm going to cut just right here. Looks like the armpit. And I'm just going to break that skin. You're using gravity to your advantage. Now there's a little section right here called, believe it or not, this little um, fleshy area right here, just above the leg, by the, above the thigh, and on the back section is called the oyster. And you want to get that as part of your leg. So just kind of get your knife under it, cut it, identify your joint, which is right here, and just cut through the joint and then you've got a whole leg, okay? You can see it. So did you like break the joint before you started cutting? The joint was pretty soft when I started. So oh, I did you want to break it so you can see where it is. Okay. Now we're gonna continue. We're gonna do the same thing with the other one. Again, we're identifying the oyster, which is right there. See how I got under it? No. And there's the joint. I'm just cutting it through using gravity, and there's a leg. Now for the uh, for the wings, 
I want to give it a little bit of flesh. I'm going to borrow some from the uh, from the breast. So I'm just going to cut a little bit of that breast flesh just to give the wing a little bit more flesh. Just go right to the joint, and there's your wing. Same on the other side. Using gravity. And there it is. Good sharp knife is always key. So now we have what we have left is breasts. So this is considered one breast. Now, if you're uh, if you have a recipe that calls for one breast, normally what that means is two sides of a single breast. This is a half breast. Okay, so I'm going to go through a cut through the top, right where this cartilage is. And I'm gonna use my finger to kind of separate it from that cartilage. Now right here is the wishbone. So I wanna get around that. And now I'm just gonna use my, the tip of my knife and just work it through, get as much flesh off as I can. So it doesn't have to be this like one, like perfect, smooth cut. It's actually a series of cuts. Right. So here's a breast. Now, if you're doing like a fried chicken or something like that, this is actually easily two portions. Yeah, it's huge. It's a very big breast. So you can get, conceivably, if you were to cut the leg and you were to get a thigh and a drumstick out of it. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten portions out of a single chicken. And for those that eat quite well, you might even just, even if it's five portions, that's quite a lot out of one chicken. Okay, so again, I'm just going to use my finger to kind of separate the flesh away from that that breastplate, work it around the wishbone. You can see the wishbone right here. Okay. There's a tenderloin that's just up against that cartilage. So this is a tenderloin section. So if you've ever heard of chicken fingers, they're made from these tenderloins. Careful if you have a sharp knife, just keep it far and away from your fingers. Now using gravity, I'm just gonna continue along my way here and separate it from the rib cage. And there, oops, I managed to separate that tender right off there. So this is breast two, okay? Now what we have is Gold. <laughs> this is what every chef loves because you can use this to make a beautiful stock. Um, you want to keep this on the stove for three to six hours at a very, very low heat mm. over some water and maybe some aromatics and vegetables, and you'll get a stock which at room temperature is gelatinous. And that is far better than anything that you can buy at the grocery store. Okay? So now we have a processed chicken. Do we have any questions about that or any challenges with that? Anybody? Are we good? We're good, except Rev D, I'm really yeah. sorry, but I can't switch the recording view to that small camera because it doesn't have audio. Ah, right. Close ups in the next time, use the main camera because I can't switch. Okay, so you can. Okay. Sorry. So maybe it's better if you just hand help handle this. Okay. Um, so we're going to be at this point. So it makes sense. I'm going to be doing a little bit. Of Rev D, we lost you. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but we don't have any video. Okay. 
Yes. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. See us now. Okay. Okay. So um, now that we've done a chicken, what I want to do is just do a really brief conversation about knife skills. Um, I always do this with my classes because a lot of people have a lot of questions about knives and a knife is really an extension of your arm in the kitchen. And a lot of chefs feel that this is, I feel this way, it's a very personal thing. We were talking about this yesterday. It's a very personal item. It's the most important item a chef has in the kitchen. And I can't tell you how many times that I've been in a professional kitchen and another chef stole my knife. I nearly had a meltdown. <laughs> like stole, stole your left knife or they just? They took it and they were cutting things on their, in their section with my knife because they couldn't find theirs. Um, a knife is wow. like, it's like stealing your puppy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to deal with, but um, a knife is meant to fit your hand precisely. So when you're shopping for knives, you want to make sure that it feels comfortable in your hands, that when you're cutting, and we're going to be using a cutting board, always use a cutting board that's softer than the blade, so no ceramic, no steel, no glass, no stone, no glass. Always use wood or plastic um, to cut vegetables or anything with your knife, because you want the blade to not... So what's your preference, plastic or wood, which is? I use wood because I, I just prefer what I've been using wood my whole life. And it's really easy to, um, to uh, clean it. These, the benefit of having plastic is you can put these in the dishwasher. So if you're cutting proteins with a, uh, you're cutting proteins on a, on a cutting board, it really does help. Um, the plastic really does make it easy to sanitize. When you're using wood, you'll need a 10% uh, bleach solution with water, spray that down, um, and then you can move on to vegetables. But I always like to, if I'm doing proteins, I'll do protein on one side, then I'll flip it over and do vegetables on the other side. And that's a good way to avoid cross-contamination, especially if you're doing something like chicken or, uh, or pork, which, Speaking of which, I'm gonna wash my hands real quick because I was just handling like chicken. I got a clean board, but not clean hands. So now I understand that um, wooden cutting, like wood has like antimicrobial qualities to it. Um, is, is that true or is that misinformation? That is something I've never heard. So whether that's misinformation or not, I, I couldn't tell you all I can tell you I've never heard of it. Okay. And when, when you're operating in a professional kitchen, it's not uh, wood surfacing. Okay. So, so this is Maggie, and I'm going to say I have heard that as well and read some scientific studies that looked at swabs of, of bacteria left on surfaces after various cleanings and wood had significantly fewer bacteria left on it cleaned the same way, not in the dishwasher, but cleaned the same way. So something cleaned in the dishwasher may be cleaner, but wood does kill bacteria naturally. Okay. Um, yeah, that's great to know. I think that uh, in the professional environment, they need uh, to quantify that. So they might be just taking extra precautions by using a uh, uh, a sanitizing solution on the wood because you know maybe it's not as reliable. Yeah. So, um, are we clear to move on? If anybody feels like they are we're moving too fast, I'm going to go on to, to nice to cutting skills. All right. So, I'm going to do a demo. We're just going to demo an onion. Now, a lot of people find that onions are a good place to start when it comes to. Um, when it comes to uh, knife skills. This is, in my knife skills classes, this is where most people wanna start. So this is, by the way, a, an average sized onion. When a recipe calls for an onion and they don't specify large or small, this is what you're going for. A large onion would be slightly larger than this. And 
using a sharp knife. I'm gonna just take the top off, a little bit of a sliver and a little bit of the bottom. Now what that does is it gives me a flat surface. So it's not rolling around while I'm trying to cut it. Safety is super important when it comes to using a knife. So I'm gonna put it on a flat side and then I'm gonna come at it like so with the knife right down the center. I'm gonna brace it on both sides with my hand and I'm just gonna go right through it like that. Okay, now I have two halves. Makes it a lot easier to peel when it's two halves. Don't worry about taking off the top layer if it doesn't wanna. That peel's coming off really easily. Okay, so now with an onion, we're going to be doing a small dice. So to do a small dice, we're going to put our palm down, get this pretty close to the edge of the, of the cutting surface. And you're going to take your knife horizontally, you're going to grab it thumb just, a, just ahead of the depression, forefinger just ahead of the depression, just like that. So when you pinch it, no, that's not. your grip. And then you put your hand over the handle. Um, some people want to cut like this. Some people cut like this. I know Jacques Papin does it this way and swears by it. I'm not going to say no to Jacques Papin. Uh, so put your palm down. And then using a sweeping motion like this, an arc, arcing motion, you're going to go through almost to the end, but not quite. We want the whole thing to stay together and just do Oops, that went all the way through. And then maybe three slices. Now we're gonna pinch it. We're gonna go vertically down. And then we're gonna grab it with our fingers tucked under. And we're just gonna slice down like so. And I'm doing a rocking sliding motion. And there I have relative relatively small dice. Some of these pieces, if they're just a, there's some larger pieces in there, just kind of break them up a little bit and you have the right size. I'm gonna do it again with this one, just so you can see palm down, fingers up, arcing motion, like so. Oops. And then, Now in culinary school, we spend three weeks <laughs> cutting onions. Three whole weeks doing nothing but cutting onions. Three whole weeks cutting onions. And sometimes they throw a carrot our way. <laughs> Seriously. Like onions are that important. So so in the movie Julia, Julie and Julia, so Julia Child being in culinary school in France, spending all that time cutting onions was like for real. Yes. Wow. And, and they do that because a lot of chefs coming out of culinary school, the first job they're going to get is really as a prep cook. That's, it's not very glamorous. Wow. But all they're doing is chopping vegetables and they've got to go fast. Wow. So, <laughs> so it, you know, in architecture school, most people come out spending the first couple of years just drawing toilets, like, you know, restrooms and public buildings. Right. So, I, yeah, that makes sense. I get that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now we have a diced onion. There's some larger pieces. If you, like I said, if you find some larger pieces, you wanna break them up a little bit. The goal is, this is gonna be oh. a part of the holy trinity oh. of vegetables, which is in France known as a mirepoix. A mirepoix is carrots, onions, and celery in France. There's also, um, versions in Italy, there's versions in Spain. Um, and this, this is the French version. If you go to more Mediterranean, like if you go to Italy, for instance, it's, uh, it would include red bell pepper. Okay, so I have already chopped up my Holy Trinity. And what I want is for all the pieces to be roughly the same size. So here's the carrots. 
here's a piece of celery. So I'm just kind of going for the same size. So it'll all cook evenly. Okay. But you don't have to be all anal retentive chef about it and no. use a micrometer and make sure everything's exactly no, you don't. the same. Okay. But your goal is roughly the same. So roughly the same size. So now in this, obviously those carrots and broccoli and cauliflower are way bigger than that stuff. Right, because these are gonna be cooked separately. Okay. We're gonna be uh, sauteing these up in a pan until they're nice and sweated and soft and translucent. Um, and then these are not getting cooked at all. These are just gonna get tossed in. Ah, uh, okay. And we want these to be kind of crunchy and um, and al dente when they come out of the oven. Okay. So, oh, excuse me, the ones that are frozen will be, um, will already be blended. So this particular carrot here, you know how soft that is. Oh yeah. So that's been blanched. Hold on. We don't need to cook it. But if you're doing your own raw vegetables, and as I said in the recipe, you can do any combination of vegetables you like in addition to the mirepoix. Okay. Um, then you'll want to blanch these first. Okay, so okay. now we're gonna move over to the stove. Quick question? Yes. So wait, so if, we, if we're working with frozen peas right now, we should really fast blanch them and then- No, don't, don't, flat, don't blanch the peas. No, okay. Yeah, so if you're doing, even if you're doing fresh peas, you don't need to blanch them because they, uh, they will cook perfectly without, they'll cook perfectly inside the pie okay. without being blanched. So but it's, it's, things like, so it's things like the cruciferous vegetables, like, like the broccoli, uh -huh. that, okay. and, you know, and firmer things like carrots, which if you don't blanch them, they'll end up being a little too crunchy. And celery also? Uh, celery, yeah, I would, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. So you can either blanch the celery or you can quickly um, toss that in with your mirepoix. If I've got mushrooms, is that a good thing or not? Mushrooms is great. You want to cook those ahead of time, too. So mushrooms, speaking of Julie, Julia Child, who's my idol, um, my, the biggest tragedy of my life is I never got to meet Julia. <laughs> um, she always said, don't crowd the pan, right? When you're cooking mushrooms, don't, don't crowd the pan. They will not brown if you add too many mushrooms because they sweat, they release a lot of liquid, and they will not brown if you put too many in there. Also, when it comes to mushrooms, don't wash them. Don't let them touch water at all. If you're gonna clean mushrooms, just use a, a dry or a damp towel or cloth and just brush off any dirt that's on there. They're perfectly sanitary. So uh, you don't have to worry about that. All right, so we're ready to go to the stove? Yeah. Excellent. Sorry, I have to keep like messing around with phones because of batteries. I need to do this one. Wrong one. <laughs> I can't hold the phone and do the stove. I'm gonna have to take. Okay, what you need to do. Okay, now turn that to the little spark. There you go. That should. You know what? Now that I think about it, that one doesn't work. So. Okay. So this one has uh, technical difficulties. Stand by. <laughs> um, I want this one. That's the oven. This one? That's the burner. Isn't it? Um, this is the oven. They all, they all spark when you turn on the sparker. Okay. Yeah, they all they all spark that way. That so that's the oven. This is the oven. Uh, uh, here, can you hold this? I'll hold this. Yeah. Okay. Watch, watch the expert in action. Oh, let's. <laughs> can we do this one? Can we do this one? Yeah. Yeah, that one, the... it's, it's light, lighting. I see the flame. There we go. Ah, perfect. Okay. All right, here. Okay. 
Okay. Now, you're going to want to get your pan nice and hot. And what we're going to do first, let's see. Let's do our mirepoix first. Let's, yeah, let's do the mirepoix first. Okay. Are we putting oil in the pan? So we're going to do our mirepoix first. We're going to do our carrots, onion, celery, and some, uh, some garlic. And that's going to be our first task. But so you need oil, right? So, oil. You, so you want to get the pan hot before you put oil into it. Right. Okay. One of the first things I learned about cooking was from the frugal gourmet. Hot pan, cold oil, food won't stick. Yeah. So I'm getting the pan nice and hot before I add my oil. Now, this is probably not the best oil to use. This is extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil has a very low smoke point. If you want to use a good stir fry or, um, or sauteing oil, you'll want to use a light olive oil or a canola or vegetable oil, or um, some people like to use avocado oil. That's also got a, uh, a high smoke point. I'm going to see if we have a little bit. How about coconut oil? Uh, Grapeseed oil. Grapeseed oil, right? Yeah, Isn't that, that's canola, is canola, right? No. Grapeseed. Grape oh. Grapeseed. Oh, rapeseed. Grape. Right. Yeah, which is such a horrible sounding name, so they changed it. Okay, so I'm adding a little bit of vegetable oil in here. And, uh... Is that about a tablespoon for? Yeah, that was about a tablespoon, maybe a tablespoon and a half. Okay, thanks. And you had some butter. Yes. I'm going to add a little bit of butter as well, probably about a tablespoon, in addition to that tablespoon of, of oil. Now, the reason we put oil in with the butter is that we'll keep the butter from burning. This adds a little bit of a barrier. You can see that's quite hot. It's all right. I'm gonna add, I'm just take that off for a second. I'm gonna add my onions first. Boy, it's hard to flip that and hold the camera at the same time. So we're just gonna get these, just gonna cook these in here for about a minute and then we'll add the rest of our vegetables. Now, one skill that's really useful in the kitchen is being able to flip ingredients in a pan. So the key, if you wanna try this, if you wanna practice this, You'll practice this over carpet with a cold pan and some dry beans. <laughs> and you'll just practice your flipping skills to get your ingredients to flip correctly. Um, the benefit of flipping like this is you're not bruising delicate ingredients. Like if you're doing zucchini or something, you want to minimize the amount of stirring and you want to do more of this kind of thing. And this is really effective in turning ingredients. And that, so that, that kind of flipping is why, why, why they call it sauté, right? Because yeah, yeah. sauté means to jump. So now I'm adding the rest of my mirepoix. Now I'm also going to season this up. It's good to season your ingredients as you go. So add a good dose of salt. You can add some pepper at this point if you like. I'll tell you, I love working on these industrial stove tops. You, just, you get a lot of BTUs out of these burners. You can see that flame dancing up. It's just I don't know. That's fun. <laughs> it is fun. When I lived in San Francisco, I had a stove just like this. Six burners. Uh, it was gosh. great. Yeah. 
Now you can still do this if you have an electric stove top. It's just not quite as visual. And the, uh, the oil wouldn't have started smoking quite so fast. Probably not. Because we got, we got a high flame, which is essential for saute. So we're just going to get these softened up a bit. This process takes about three to five minutes of cooking. Just kind of pushing it around the pan. Always keeping it moving. That's one of the uh, key points of doing a saute is, is making sure that those ingredients are always moving around. If you were to let this sit, you would get caramelization going on the bottom really fast. So I thought caramelization is a good thing. If you want it, sure. But our goal here is just to evenly cook these vegetables so that they're soft. Um, if you want a caramelized vegetable, you can absolutely let it sit. So if I let this sit, you can see it's already getting quite brown along the, around the edges. Yeah. That's what you're going to get. You're going to see some browning. Oh, yeah. But if I just move it around, it'll Ooh, even melt your foam. Please don't melt my foam. <laughs> Once that's up, I'm going to be putting it right back in the bowl that I prepped them in. And can you tell us when you know that it's done? You're going to see um, that the onions and everything are translucent. They're, it's going to look soft. You can test it with your hands. And I'd say this is about there. This is really close. And also it depends on how much flavor you want. This is just the base of flavor for your, for your pot pie. It's gonna give you a good base flavor. So this is in addition to the, uh, to the other vegetables that I mentioned, because those other vegetables are really like a vegetable side dish. This is, you can almost think of this as part of the sauce. Oh, hence the difference in the sizes. Right, okay. I get so move back, I'm gonna put this a little tiny bowl. <laughs> this is going to be a challenge. That is a tiny little bowl. It's like it's like a high dive into a little water glass. <laughs> Oops. All right, now we don't want to clean this pan out. Absolutely, don't want to clean this pan out because we're gonna. What we're trying to do is develop a crust on the bottom of this pan. So under high heat, put this right back on, and then I'm gonna immediately take my chicken, which has been sitting, if you wanna, you can, you don't have to sit, let it sit in oil if you don't want to. If you didn't add oil and salt and pepper to your chicken ahead of time, add some oil to your pan now, and then just lay your chicken in. And just let it sit there. You do not want to move it. And the reason you don't want to move it is it will naturally release from the pan when that uh, Maillard process, which is the process of browning, when that is achieved, you get a nice brown crust on the chicken, it will self-release. Self-release. Self for 19 years now. And when we first met, I was the best. Uh, I think that's safe to say. <laughs> okay, maybe maybe that's maybe that's laying it on a little thick. But I think I had more experience cooking because I was I'm slightly older. But um, he went to culinary school and 
just like blew me away and I'm still constantly learning from him. But one of the things that amazes me is it seems like he uses a ton of oil, a ton of fats, and a ton of salt for what I typically cook with. And I think that's why the food is so much better. It's like he cooks like a restaurant chef. And restaurant food, a fine restaurant is always so much better, isn't it? Yeah. I wish we could turn this bench on, but if we do that, it's going to be loud. Yeah. Don't worry about it. We're going to add water in a second. I'm just going to turn this over. See how I get a nice brown crust there? And that's released really quickly. Now, this is what's going to give us some flavor in our sauce. Because we're going to be using the liquid. Some of this liquid to make our sauce. Those are really high heat. I mean, this is like screaming hot, right? Just to reduce the smoke because it's getting smoky. Did you right. flatten those chicken breasts first? What was that? Did you flatten the chicken breast first? I did. You, know, like... no, you don't have to do that. Okay, good. Because mine are fat. What was that, Diana? I said mine are fat. My chicken breasts. <laughs> Never okay. mind. It'll be okay. So you're going to get some water. And you're going to add some water to your pan slowly. It's going to smoke. That's crazy. And what you want to do is cover it. You're going to cover those breasts with water. Just completely covered. So absolutely none of it is a little bit can poke up the top like that. Okay. Okay. And so I've got some water in there. I'm going to turn the heat down once this starts to simmer. I'm going to add some aromatics to this. You don't have to do this if you don't want to, but what I've got in here, I've got some carrots and some celery. Uh, I've got some, uh, some crushed garlic. I've got some oregano, some peppercorns, and I'm just going to add that in here. So what I'm really doing is making a court bouillon. A what bouillon? It's called a court bouillon. Like C-O-U-R-T, correct. Now the court bouillon is basically a flavored braising liquid. Okay. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna let this poach. Um, the poaching will very tenderly cook that chicken. We wanna get the temperature of this water at about 175 or so, 180. And that will very gently cook this chicken. So this water should barely, barely bubble. Um, and you can use your probe thermometer if you feel like it's getting a little too warm. You can just test the temperature of the water and just see where it is. And that's going to um, get our chicken to about 160. We're going to get the chicken uh, just, just slightly undercooked. And then we're going to take it out of the water. And you'll get a nice, beautiful, tender chicken. Now you absolutely can roast your chicken and use roasted chicken for this. You can hit, actually go to the grocery store and buy roasted chicken and use the roasted chicken for your pot pie. That's absolutely fine. But if you're going to do a whole chicken, this is a good way to get the chicken ready for the pot pie. Okay, so this is really bugging me. Oh, no, that doesn't matter. This garlic skin in the... Yeah. So that, you don't have to worry about it because that's not going to... We're going to strengthen it all out. Okay. That's just adding flavor. You can actually, if you're using onions, you can just use the onion skins as well. It doesn't matter. Okay. You can use, if you're, um, if you're cutting up your mirepoix and you have scraps left over, you can use scraps for your court bouillon. Flavor oh, it up the okay. way Yeah. I'm behind. Um, what, okay, after we put the water in the chicken, what did you put in the chicken? Is it some of our vegetables? Or you have something yeah. else? I just added some flavorings to the water. You can add whatever you want to the water. You can add some parsley, add some a little bit of onion in there. You can add garlic in there. And that flavor, the flavor of the water is actually going to penetrate inside the chicken breast. 
have a flavored chicken breast. Okay. Add a ton of salt. Look how much salt. <laughs> That's how much I'm going to add. It's a lot. Because it's all just going to go right into the breast and give it some flavor. How much was that, Mike? So started about a tablespoon? Oh, yeah. As much as, so you want the water to taste kind of briny. So I turn my water down. So Diana, this is why the thickness of your breasts, like the fact that they're really fat, it won't really matter. You'll just have to, you know, poach it for a little bit longer to get it cooked all the way through. Okay. So now this process takes about 20 minutes to really cook the breast. What do we do for 20 minutes? So for 20 minutes, what we can do is we can make our sauce. Woohoo! Okay. One last question. Did you put in okay. all your vegetables into the broth or just some of them? Sorry. Yeah, he just put a bit of celery and onion and garlic in there. And that, that was, was separate, separate from, from the mirepoix. Right. Reserve the rest. Separate from the Right. So the, the mirepoix that he cooked is this right here. Yeah. And then yeah. there's the frozen vegetables over here. And those haven't gone in yet. That was just a bit to give that that stock a bit of flavor. Great. Thanks. So actually, I think this would be a good time to pastry and do our first turn and then show it. Woohoo! Okay. Let's do that. It's exciting. And it's been about 50 minutes. I think since we did our pastry. Clean up. Do you want a different cutting board or? No, but I'm going to use the cutting board of all. Okay. Ah, this is where the nice cold stainless steel surface comes in handy, huh? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, Okay. Okay. We haven't used the chicken stock yet, right? Correct. Okay. Chicken stock is going to be used for your, uh, your stock. Okay. They're chopping up a little bit. I don't know if anybody else is okay. having that problem. Does anybody else feel like we're choppy? Do we have a good connection or a bad connection? Uh, it's occasionally choppy, Mike. Okay. Um, if you need me to repeat myself, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so we have a little bit of flour. <laughs> it's all purpose. We're just gonna put the moving on to our pastry. We're gonna do our very first <clears throat> turn. Now, um, you don't have to do this with flaky pastry if you don't want to, but I find that the results are far better if we do it this way. We're gonna do like a, almost like a lamination. So you wanna get this nice and covered with flour, get a rolling pin, and I'm gonna pound this. Just give it a couple good hits. And we're just gonna roll it out. We wanna get it to about a quarter of an inch or so. And ideally you're, you're doing a rectangle. If you wanna do a rectangle, you're, you're uh, rolling out the corners, rolling out the corners. And this is a good time to remember that Mike's doing a half recipe here since it's just the two of us. Right, yours is gonna look a lot like a lot more if you're doing a full recipe. Okay, can you see what I've got? Yes, um, mine's all crumbly. Does that mean I didn't put enough water in when I made it? Um, it could be that you just don't have enough water. Let's see how it goes. Just keep try, try to work with it. If it's unworkable, um, you can pat it with a little bit of water to see if okay. that helps. Mine doesn't look anywhere near big enough. Doesn't look big enough? 
Yeah, this is what I have. <laughs> is yours a half recipe? Yes. Okay. Um, just just roll it out and see what you get. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to brush off. You can use a pastry brush for this. Just brush off the flour on this one side. And we're going to do what we call a book fold. So this is where you move it toward the center, move it toward the center like that, brush that off, and then fold it again. And there's your book fold. Okay. Now we're going to roll it out to a rectangle again. It's kind of important that your pastry be cold. As it warms up, it becomes elastic and it bounces back. It's very hard to work with when it's warm. And also, it'll be a lot less flaky and more tough if you're working with warm pastry. So again, I'm gonna do another fold and then fold again, it's down. And that's the last fold before we, before we uh, toss it in the refrigerator. So it's a little bit elastic. Right, it's elastic, but, but once not, we not chill it, it'll, it won't be. Okay. So now I'm just gonna wrap this up again. So we're gonna chill it and we'll work with it again in maybe 30 minutes or so. Once we're done with everything else. So, okay, when I make pie, what kind of what kind of crust would you call this? This is a flaky pastry. A flaky pastry. Yeah. So, okay, so us great British baking show fans, that's <laughs> a puff pastry or a rough no. puff pastry or a rough puff, as we call it, is when you have the butter mixed in with the flour, but then when you roll it out, you're adding a little bit more butter on top and then folding it in. You're still doing a lamination. But the lamination is not uh, like a flattened brick of butter. It's it's like you're sprinkling butter on top and then you're folding it and then you're rolling it and folding it with and that's it. Okay. That's a rough puff. Okay. So this is really just a flaky pastry dough. This is like just kind of amping up a regular pie crust. Okay. Now, if you want to, if you want to make a delicate, a much a much more delicate. Uh, pastry crust, you can use a half and half mixture of butter and shortening. Um, shortening is a miracle invention that uh, a lot of cooks from the 30s and 40s really rejoiced over because it made their pastries a lot more delicate. A lot more flaky or? It's just not necessarily more flaky, but just more delicate. It had a, a, a more tender. Okay aspect to it. You can even consider it to be a little more, um, not mealy, mealy is not the word I want to use, but just a, it's, it, it falls apart a lot okay. easier. And it's, for some people, they like that. It's a little more tender. Okay. So, am I leaving this flat when I put it in the fridge or am I folding it back up and then putting it in the fridge? So you're, so you're going to be have you'll, you'll have it done two things. book folds. Right. And after the second book fold, you put it in the refrigerator. Wrap it back in plastic, put it back in the fridge, yeah. right? Exactly. Okay. So now, do you have a probe thermometer somewhere? A what? A probe thermometer. Do we have a probe thermometer? Uh, uh, hmm. Hold this one. <laughs> Denise's going to look for a probe thermometer for us. Meanwhile, you get to look at me. I don't think we have a probe thermometer. <laughs> this is a, uh, a beautiful professional kitchen that we're using here. Um, most okay. people don't have access to the kind of industrial equipment that we're using here. Um, like for instance, this is a convection oven, which will cut the time of your baking almost in half. Okay, so if we don't have a probe thermometer, we're just gonna test the doneness of this. I might wanna flip this over while it's cooking. 
Because I may, whoops. Because I may have not totally submerged it. So this is a good time for you guys to check the temperature of your chicken. Anchor this back. Oops. Okay, here we go. Mine's only eighty. <laughs> you use a That's chickeny. Okay. All right. How is everybody doing? Are we okay? Good. Still only 110 on the chicken. Got two angles going, sound on one, sound not sound on the other. <laughs> okay. So now at this point, we can move on to our sauce. I'm gonna move this camera. So now you're gonna be looking at Red Denise's camera. But hearing me on my camera, uh, no, Mike, we can't. So not this one? I'll Mike, use mine. Mike, Mike, we can't see from that camera. Okay. We can only see from the camera that has the audio. That means we have to wait for Rev Denis to come back. Yes, we need to have Rev Denis come back to <laughs> his camera. Because gotcha. I, I, I can't he make a non-audio camera the focus of the Session. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. So we'll just wait for him to come back. He dashed out for a second. Yes. All right. So that's good. And and we just need to use the camera that has the audio. Okay. The close up camera. So here's a question. Does anybody want to take a quick break if they want to catch up and then we can reconvene in about 10 minutes? Does that would that be helpful? Yeah, my chicken is behind yeah. your Okay, do we want to yes. just, just kind of chill out for 10 minutes and then come back and we'll start in with our sauce? Does that, does that sound fair? Yep, I think that's okay. Fair. Great. All right, see you in 10. Okay. And see all the rest of you in 10. Stay connected, don't, don't disconnect. See you shortly. Okay, I'm gonna hang around for a bit. Yep. This is fun. Wine go with pastry. I love 
love the way my kitchen smells. <laughs> but that's always true when I'm making anything. Hey, Lynn. Hey, how are you? How are you? I was muted. just realized my mute had been on. My dog's been enjoying the pieces of pastry that fell on the floor. Oh. What, what's not on me or, you know. <laughs> it's, did you all get nice rectangle type pastry? After I did the book folds, I did. Mine is. Uh, it takes a little practice. Well, you know, I've and done it before, but with my mother's recipe. <laughs> yeah, the first, the first I love couple listening couple. to your stories. So my my nephew uh, attended the Culinary Arts Institute of Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh, and uh, graduated with an associate's degree. But he told us about the time that uh, he had a six week course in how to cook broccoli. Yeah. Oh. One test. Six weeks. Six. Mean, can you imagine? And the final test, the only test, was to cook up a pan of broccoli, and the instructor came around and tasted two pieces out of it. And that was pass fail. And they had to pass. And the instructor, after the whole thing was over, said, and he really never liked broccoli in the first place. <laughs> and he said, No, I never liked broccoli. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm saving half of all of my ingredients to do at some other night. I'm only doing half of the ingredients. That's what, that's what I'm doing is a half recipe. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Well, and, you know, and I didn't realize that I should do that. So I, I have, you know, mirepoix and I have all of the other things for a full recipe and I'll just put them in the refrigerator. Oh, mirepoix goes great as a soup starter. It'll be great as a soup starter or I'll do in a day or two, I'll do, a, I'll do this again and make it, but you know. We have a 17 year old boy that uh, eats anything uh, that uh, gets put in front of him. So I don't think we'll have to get it for this. Yeah, you, you don't need to worry about this. Whatever you produce tonight will be eaten. Yes. 
It's uh, chicken pot pie and turkey pot pie are his favorite, so it's uh, it's going to be gone. All right, that's <laughs> lovely. I'm making the full recipe too, and I'm taking it to my daughter who's moving Tuesday. And there's eight of them in her family. So you're taking this to them on the night after they move? On the night they move, they all yeah, have. Yeah, that's lovely. Oh, I mean, you know, to go through the whole moving process and have somebody bring a dinner like this. I mean, not just a dinner, but a dinner like this. Yeah, they'll be, they, they love chicken pot pie. It's one of this our is, normal family meals, so. This is gonna be lovely. That's a great thing to do. Yep. Mag, a practical question. Should we all be preheating our ovens? Yes, it, the oven should be on. To three, oh. whatever. 350 yeah, okay. is <laughs> what the instruction said. Thank you, Andy. See? I don't have the instructions because you just sent them today, right? Well, yeah. no, I sent I sent them yesterday and then I resent them today. Um, I have the list, but I printed it up right after I signed up, and then today I was on a Zoom call all day, so everybody's got the recipe <laughs> and well, different I, ingredients. Yeah, well, yes, la I mean, it's not different ingredients. It's it's a slightly different description of the process, and. I didn't get that until late last night. So, you know, what I sent all of you first was the recipe and the ingredients that Mike had sent me. And you all had that and you knew what to get. Um, and then he said, mm, let, let, me, let, me, let me put a little more structure on this. We did. He put some more structure on it. Um, uh, you know, some of us got into the following of those instructions and some of us didn't. And that's why the class is a little flexible. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a good UU term. Let's be flexible. Um, it's our beta test. Yes, it is. And speaking of which, what was the name of the bakery that uh, you said about talking to them about possibly doing a Zoom class of cupcake decorating? Um, oh gosh. Uh, it's a Cleveland bakery called are you talking about white flour, maybe? Maybe white flour. Yeah, it started with the W, I think. Yeah, I think it might have been a white flour. My and talk to them about helping us with a, you know, a fundraiser okay. and would teach class. My, there, I also know of another bakery that actually my daughter-in-law does um, marketing for that I might also ask her if she's interested. I mean, if she's interested and they want to do it, we would much rather support members. Yeah, I mean, it's um, a small business that just started up, so. Yeah, yeah, so let's do it. Okay. Yep, we're, we're happy to do that. I already started feelers out there, and but I wanted to get the name because I couldn't remember past W. <laughs> That we had mentioned in the uh, board meeting. That is. Well, there's Jan. Jan's still here. Jan, this is. Hi, for Jan. You. <laughs> Love you, Jan. <laughs> Maybe she's not there. Maybe she's still there. No, away. we saw it. We saw it. How exciting. That's wonderful it's news. great. <laughs> I stayed up till midnight last night. All right. I don't know how many hours I put in on this. Okay, I'm on, Diana. I unmuted myself. You got on. Oh, okay. Yes? Okay. We're on. So what I put on. We're on. Yep. Did you Oops. see this? I, where I don't have you. Yes, I, good for you. When did you do it? Actually, wait, wait, wait. Right. So, last night. 
So again, wait, 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 wait. Uh, again, we're focusing on the class. <laughs> you, everybody except Reb Denis, or you could meet yourselves because this is what the focus of the class is tonight. But it's break. Okay. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, is anybody not on that we need to wait for? Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know how to check that. Uh, everybody who has been on should be on. Great. Okay. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you've all had a chance to catch up. Um, we have completed our chicken. I took my chicken out of the court bouillon. I've cut it up. So if while I'm explaining other things, you can uh, get your chicken out of your water, if you haven't already, and cut it up. So I've done uh, some small bite size. These are, this is basically a bite size chicken. Might be a little bit larger than your vegetable or perhaps the same size. This is about the same size as our vegetable. So you're looking for like a bite size piece. So I took my thick uh, chicken breasts, I sliced them in half uh, through the center so they weren't quite as thick. And then I started chopping them up into cubes. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna toss that in with your frozen vegetables, which have now been defrosted, as well as your um, mirepoix that you sauteed on the stove. All mix that together, just kind of toss it with your hand and just kind of get it all mixed together. Whatever keeping isn't quite the temperature yet. Okay. Yeah, my chicken is 160? 152. All right, oh, getting close. I'm at 120. So you may want to up your heat a little bit. Well, that's because you have giant breasts, Diana. <laughs> Excuse me. Chicken breast. She has gigantic chicken breasts. Yeah. yeah. You people are terrible. Get your minds out of the gutter. So, uh, for those of you who are waiting for your chicken, um, you can let that hang out in the uh, court bouillon, and we're going to move on to um, our sauce. So, Rev. Denis, if you will, yes, follow me to the stove. I wanted to unmute. I have a quick question. Yes. I am making, um, I kind of split the recipe so I could have a, veg a veggie one and a meat one. So my veggie one's going to have the curry sauce. So okay. with my coconut milk, do I still need to use the heavy whipping cream in the sauce? You don't have to if you don't want to. In fact, you don't have to use whipping cream at all if you don't want to use dairy. It's up to you. The whipping cream adds, a, adds a, just a creaminess to it, and you're going to get that from your coconut milk, so don't worry about it. Okay. Okay? Thanks. All right, so um, we're going to go over to our stove top where we have, let's turn this on. <laughs> oh, this is already on. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to melt some butter. And what we're going to do first is we're going to make a roux. A roux is a combination of fat and flour. I don't know. And they're equal parts fat and flour, right? Um, no. No. So uh, another myth bunk. Another myth bunk. What you're going for is texture on this. It's going to be roughly the same, but what you're going for when you combine your butter or your fat, you can always use olive oil or any other fat for this. You don't have to use butter. Um, what you're going for is something to the consistency of wet sand. So, we're going to melt our butter. I'm going to turn this up a little bit. Maybe not. It's pretty high. You want to melt your butter first. It's Is that our four ounces? An excess of flour. So, have a little bit of extra flour on hand just in case you need to add more. You're not going to add all of your flour at once. Add, add flour till you get to the wet sand consistency. Use a whisk for this. We'll move to a spoon after we add our liquid. 
a room is a uh, is something that you see often in French sauces. It's uh, it's what gives sauces their their uh, structure and also a base flavor. So there are different types of roux. There's a white roux, there's a blonde roux, there's a brown roux. We're gonna be doing a blonde roux. I think I have a little bit of something, something in there. Oh, little, it looks like a little extra wrapping. A little extra, yeah. So basically, like in New Orleans, when they talk about working a roux, that's just getting it from being a blonde one to a, a darker one, right? Yeah, in, in New Orleans, they use dark roux more than blonde roux. And that's because what makes their beans and rice so yeah, phenomenal. As well as gumbo. So now if, if I were doing a vegan version of this, I'd be using like coconut oil and then adding coconut milk instead of cream, right? Yeah. Okay, see, I'm adding a little bit of flour at a time until I get the right consistency. And you're gonna see, see that looks like wet sand. You see that? Now, as that cooks, this is going to become a little bit more liquidy. As you cook a roux, it becomes runnier and it becomes uh, less powerful as a thickening agent. So that thickening quality is gonna slowly diminish as you cook it. Darker roux have less thickening power than light roux. Okay. But we're going for thickening here, right? We're going for both. We want flavor and thickening. Okay. We're going to do... So it's sauce. going to be that in between. Yes. Okay. So blonde gives you the best of both worlds. It's not going to give you quite as deep of a flavor as a brown roux will. You can see it's starting to color already. Blonde roux is, is just as it sounds. It's not white. A little bit, a little bit more color. See, that's that's we're getting to a blonde roux right now. There's a blonde roux right here. So I'm going to add at this point some stock. Add a little bit at a time. Use two hands for this. And you don't have to get in, so it's looking like you don't have to get it perfectly smooth between the addings of the liquid. No. Okay. So the reason we're adding a little bit of time is we don't want to overdo it. We don't want to add too much liquid so that it becomes too runny. Right. It's better to thin it if it needs to be thin. So now as this become, gets to a boil, it's going to be, um, it's going to thicken. You can see how like at the edges of the pan, it has that like almost caramelly kind of yeah. bubbliness to it. Like you can see the thickness of it at the edges. Right. So now I'm gonna add some of my court bouillon that I strained out. I still got a little bit of flavor specks in it. Let's call it that. Oh my God, it smells good. And then that will give it a little extra flavor. So now, why didn't you just use all court bouillon? Because the stock has been cooked a lot longer. It has more of the chicken protein in it. Aha. So it's going to have more of a chickeny flavor. The court bouillon is going to have a court bouillon flavor, less chicken flavor. Okay. So it's going to taste more like the salt and the garlic and the onion right. and the celery. And, and the caramelized okay. fawn that was in the bottom of the pan, that crust mm -hmm. that gave, gave it some chicken flavor. You can smell that. You can smell how oh, it smells incredible. And right, yeah, you're right. It doesn't smell chickeny. It smells like herbs and celery and garlic and right. Yeah. I'm just gonna add a little more. And that'll be the end of that. We're letting it boil and then we're gonna add our cream. Why are we using the water that the chicken is poached in? Why why am I or why am I not? Why are you not? 
I did. I did use the court bullion. I used about one quarter to, so like, let's say one to four parts. Okay. And so what we were just saying about what we were just saying about that, Diana, is that the, the stock was cooked for a long time and has a really deep, dense chickeny flavor. But the okay. court bouillon, you know, the water from the poaching, that's uh -huh. the stuff that smells, it tastes, it, well, I haven't tasted it, but it smells like yeah. celery and salt and garlic. So it's bringing another layer of flavor to it. Okay, so on our recipes, is that what we were supposed to be using for chicken stock? Because I went out and bought no. chicken stock. No, no, you want to use the chicken stock primarily, and if you're if you if you want to use court bouillon, you can. I'm just kind of giving yeah. you a little um, okay. you know, extra tip in there. So, like, if you went out and bought, you know, one of those five dollar roasted chickens at Costco, and you wanted to make this, you could just use, you know, the chicken from Costco and use the, you know, stock from a can or a box, and it'd be great. But because he poached it, he's got that extra little poaching liquid that gives another layer of flavor to it. Okay, so you can uh, see. Question. At this point, is all the chicken stock in there that is part of the recipe? Yes. So I used, actually, so you can see how much chicken stock I have left over. I actually used court bouillon in place of this amount. Um, because I wanted to use the court bouillon, it was so nice. But you don't have to, that's not in the recipe. You don't have to use the court bouillon, but you can. You can use all of it if you want to use all of it instead of chicken stock. It's up to you to do that. So this is the, the consistency we're going for. This is a sauce consistency, all right? Oh. Now at this point, this is when we start to season it. So I'm thinking about the old, like, sticking to the back of a spoon test. Yeah. Look how nice that sticks to the back of a spoon. I That's a good thickness. Does it mean I didn't use enough, I go. didn't make big enough room? So it's <laughs> super important that you taste <coughs> as you go. So what, what, what were you asking, Diana? Well, my brew is not thick. I mean, my sauce is not thick at all. It's runny. Does that mean I didn't do enough roux? It could be. Uh, did you add the, the specified amount in the recipe? Yeah, I have it, but yes. Okay. Um, you might have <laughs> added too much liquid all at once before uh, you allowed it to thicken between increments. Mm -hmm. So what's important when you're doing a sauce is you don't just combine all your ingredients at once because you're approaching the right consistency with the, uh, the measured ingredients. You're not just dumping them all in as the gospel rule. You're using those as a guideline. So those measurements are not intended to be strictly followed. So now that the sauce is a little thinner than ideal, is there anything that Diana can do or anybody can do to thicken it up? There are some tricks. Mother, <laughs> There's some tricks in the uh, restaurant biz. One of them is making a hand roux. You ever heard of that? A hand roux? A hand roux. So hand roux is you take some soft butter and you put it in the palm of your hand with some flour and you kind of rub it together and you make a little dough out of it. And then you just drop it in and thicken your sauce that way. And drop it in a little bit at a time. Yeah. You don't want to just plop a whole. Use a whisk. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So there you go. That's a good fix. I've never heard of that. Okay, so I'm going to taste. Oh, look at that. It's a little bitty half teaspoon. Now you want your, your uh, sauce to be a little on the salt forward side. Salt forward. You get that, folks? Salt wow. forward, yes. Thank you. <laughs> because. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so, so far you have in here nutmeg and salt. Nutmeg and salt. You can add some pepper. Pepper's a good thing to add. I'll do that. Oh, you know what? I know where the pepper is. I've got this. I can use this, right? Okay. I guess I don't know where the pepper is. Okay. Oh, gotta get back to the stove. 
Okay, so I'm adding some pepper. So is this pepper forward? <laughs> it's as much pepper as you like. <laughs> okay, our sauce is completed. So could you add stuff like, oh, I don't know, like chicken soup herbs, like parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, or anything like that? Yeah. If you want to add, you know, extra stuff in there, I prefer to have it a little more simple and have the ingredients of the pie speak for themselves. But it's really up to you uh, to flavor it as you wish. If you were to have this in a restaurant, typically they would keep this sauce very simple and let the ingredients come through and shine through rather than the yeah. sauce. And if you're using really good butter and really good cream and really good chicken and you're really gonna yeah yeah gonna have some great flavors there and uh red really you're gonna taste this as well oh i am here you go and, uh, Hi. Oh, that's really good yeah oh wow okay so <laughs> we've now completed our sauce and we're ready for assembly Is the flame still on under this? No, it's, nope. it's off. Wow. You want to off your heat as soon as your sauce comes to consistency and you're adding your seasonings, you don't have to keep it on the heat. Wow, this is a great texture. Yeah, it should be a nice velvety soft texture. It should not be too thick. If it's thick, the thicker it is, the more solid your drier your uh, pot pie is going to be in the end. Okay. Okay, so let's move over to the table. If you want to attach that back, you can. Yeah, it's okay. I feel useful this way. All right. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to start filling my molds. And there are two ways that we could do this. One is that you can line your molds with pastry if you want a pie that is, um, that is removable from the mold. If you're going to be eating this, in the vessel itself, then you don't need to put pastry in the bottom. So if you're freezing these, you'll probably, unless you're freezing them in a, a foil tin, um, you'll be uh, just putting your filling in and then co covering the top with pastry. Okay. Otherwise, you want to remove the, you want to line the whole thing with pastry, yeah. Do you spray the inside like of the ramekins with um, Pam or something? Uh, well, it depends. So if you're doing, these don't need it. Um, and also if you're not lining your pan with pastry, then you don't need it. Okay. So if you are putting pastry in the bottom and it's a, um, it's a stainless steel pan or something that doesn't have a nonstick coating, then you don't have to worry about it. Now here's another trick. So, if you want to line your pastry, I'm get on the other side. Okay. Okay. If you want to line your pastry or line your, uh, or if you want to remove it from the pan, you want to line it with some parchment, and you can just put it in. I cut this out already. You'll just put some parchment in here and have wings coming out the sides. Line this with your pastry. Put your filling in and then put pastry over the top and bake it off. And then you'll have these as handles to pull it out. Okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> now, I don't think we have quite enough pastry. We're, we'll, see what, we'll see what we have. Actually, I'm gonna roll out the pastry first. And see what we have. Okay. Turn this a bit so people can see multiple angles. Oh, now, if you're just gonna put pastry on the top, then we don't have to do this first. You can fill your pans first and, uh, and then do your pastry. So again, I'm gonna put some flour on the board. Roll this out. We're gonna roll our pastry out to about an eighth of an inch thick. 
That's really thin. Well, you'll see it's actually not. It you theoretically it seems thin, but it really isn't. So right now we're at about a quarter of an inch. It's pretty yeah. thick. Now you'll notice if you're rolling out your pastry right now, you'll notice that it's the chilling has reduced its elasticity. It's a lot easier to work with when it's uh, chilled. And it's kind of amazing how it's retaining a rectangular shape. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's only if you're a pro. If you're an amateur like me, it's not. So I'm just saying. <laughs> but I think the fact that there was all that, what did you call the book folding? Yeah. Yeah, that really, like, you know, it gave it that rectangular shape. And because of the bit of refrigeration, it feels like that's what's making it keep that shape, yeah. helping it keep that shape. So you can be liberal with the flour at this point, since we're not folding it into the dough anymore. It's just keeping it from sticking to your surface. And I would say we probably, in, in this case, we probably don't have enough to line a whole pan for our, for our recipe. So I'm probably just gonna fill these up and then put that on top. So the way you fill, you're going to put some of your filling into one layer on the bottom like so. Make sure you tamp it down. You want it to be pretty dense. Again, I'm doing a half recipe, so uh, we're able to make three one pound pot pies. And then I'm gonna take some sauce. And we're doing it this way because, say if I have some extra filling that I don't wanna sauce, I can keep that for something else. I don't have to combine the sauce with the filling. And you want to layer it in so that you get plenty of sauce throughout. Okay, we're going to do another layer. So how many layers total will you do in each? I might do three, it looks like. So these are going to be puffing up over the top. Yeah, they might. It's hard to tell at this point. Oh my God, that smells good. It's just a little to top that off. And you'll notice, I have, I'm going to probably have some left over. Some of this filling, not much, but some. And I think it's because I used a whole one pound bag of vegetables. <laughs> that would Instead of like a 12 ounce bag. Instead. Okay. So I'm going to add a little more sauce to uh. each. Finish that off. See, it thickens as it gets colder, but when you bake this off, it's just gonna be a perfect, nice, thick gravy texture. All right. Okay. Now, I'm going to I'm going to take my pastry. Let's see, do three pieces.
you're going to cut out whatever shape you're using. If you're doing rounds, you can use a, uh, a round uh, biscuit cutter. So just to get a sense of it, like you could do something like that and then cut a little beyond it? Yeah, so you want a little bit of overhang. We're cutting it so that there's probably about a half inch or so overhang. So you can see how much bigger that is. So I'm going to um, first cut some vent holes in this. And this will just allow steam to escape. All right, I'm just gonna lay these on top. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna crimp around the edge. So it kind of grabs the edge of this. And then I'm just gonna do a little, you can use a fork if you wanna do it that way. On the next one, could you show us how to use a fork? Yep. Do we have a fork? No, we don't have any forks here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's no then. <laughs> we, we only have forks at East Shore Unitarian Universalist <laughs> Church. <laughs> um, I'm happy to do that if you have a fork. Let, let me grab a fork. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's getting a visit to the pantry. Okay, here we go. Great. Okay, so if you're using a fork, again, make sure that you've crimped it around the edges. And then just seal it with a fork, just like so. Now, are you gonna leave all these dangly bits or cut them away? You can cut them away if you wanna make it neater. Can use scissors for that it's probably easier but you know i'll probably just leave it for now okay they're super cute yeah so like that's probably a little too uh long so i can just cut that down a little there bit. you go Now these uh, top crusts are gonna puff up nicely in the oven, like a nice puff pastry. We have to put this into the oven directly, don't we? We're not gonna do that. We're not? No, I'm gonna show them the finished one. Okay. Okay, so now we've got our covered <clears throat> And so I'm noticing that there's like little little bits where the crust got really thin in here where it's not totally covering the edge of the pan. It's okay. And it's perfectly fine, right? It is, it's fine. These can be, you know, however, I mean, I would spend more time on this if I was so inclined, but uh, you know, I would make it a little neater around the edges um, because it's not my kitchen. I'd have to ask you for Preserves and stuff like that yeah to make it a little cleaner um, so typically what you would do is you would lay your crust over the top and then you would just take scissors and snip it to fit about one half inch over the edge and then you would crimp it and you would have a lovely uh and it's all good this is just all good rustic exactly so now what i'm going to do is an egg wash so an egg wash is really, uh, depending on who you ask, it's, it's either an egg white, or it's an egg white with an egg yolk, or it's just an egg yolk, or it's an egg yolk with water. <laughs> We're doing a whole egg Thank and that's you. it. I'm just going to, wow, that's really yellow. If they're good eggs, they're, you know, grass fed, free range. So I'm just gonna whisk this up until I have lengthened those proteins enough to where it's liquidy. If it's not um, whisked enough, it's gonna feel more gelatinous. 
it's going to feel more connected. The more you lift this up, the more liquidy it becomes. So if you're seeing bits of white and yolk in there, you haven't whisked it enough. Right. So you have a uniform mixture like so. Now you're gonna take a pastry brush or a silicone brush like this. We're just gonna brush over the tops, get evenly coated around the top and the edge. And what this does is it gives you a nice golden crust on the top, a little bit of a shine, and it also gives you some crunch, a light crunchy texture and along the crimping. So this is way more egg wash than I've ever put on a pastry before. And now I'm understanding why my egg wash has never come out very nice. <laughs> okay, you just want to get it in the crevices uh, and make sure that it's well coated. I missed a detail, is that egg white only? This is egg, egg white and egg yolk. This is the whole oh. egg. The whole egg, okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that's all, just the egg. Yeah, just egg, no water, nothing else. No water. And now, um, uh, look at the way that it's pooling up along there. It's really cool. Yeah. So now what I wanna do is I'll add some pepper to the top. You can add whatever you want to the top. You don't have to add anything if you don't want to. I'm gonna put some oregano on the top of this. And uh, I had some gray salt somewhere. Grab some gray salt. Gray salt? Now every chef has their favorite finishing salt. This is where you're gonna use a finishing salt if you wanna use a finishing salt. Whether it's a truffle salt, would that be delicious? Oh, la -dee da Or, uh, or a, um, a fluorescel. Um, I have gray. I'm going to use some gray salt on the top. Just kind of put a little in my hands. And I'm just going to sprinkle the tops with a little bit of gray salt. Salt forward. Salt forward. <laughs> okay. And now these are going to go in the oven. We're just going to, actually, we're going to bake these off later. I'm gonna show you the final result because these are gonna take roughly about 30 to 45 minutes to bake. So we're not going to uh, take our class quite that far. So, and, and we would totally put these in the oven right now except the convection oven is so loud you wouldn't be able to hear us anymore. Right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what they look like in the end. Now, let's get a good look at this. This is a completed one which, in which I lined the whole pan with the pastry and I was able to take it out. Can you see that? Oh, uh, Isn't that gorgeous? So, yes. That's amazing. Um, it really is a thing of beauty. And look at how it's not perfect. And yet it still looks amazingly perfect. So we want to cut it open and see the inside. <laughs> oh. Okay. So here's the inside of our pie. Oh. And of course, this is cold. Yeah, so. we got it out of the oven about an hour ago or so, right? Yeah. Um, and I did a different vegetable mix for this one. This is red bell peppers to give it some color. Um, but... When it's hot, it's a little more oozy. Little, it's a little looser in the middle, but you can see. So this kind of thing, you can actually uh, freeze these. Uh huh. Um, but I would, if I were to do it that way, I would probably, um, I don't know. I might do them. Might freeze them in the container and then bake them off. So now. Now that this has the egg wash, 
and all that does is it like imperative that it get into the oven pretty quickly or could it get frozen like this it get frozen like that oh wow i mean it's not ideal it's right not ideal. okay um i would rather not do the egg wash until it's ready right like ready to go in yeah um but this was for the purpose of demo. so um, this is what i'm dying to see look at that bottom <laughs> it's not soggy at all. Paul Hollywood would be proud. Yeah, so you get like the crust has a nice flakiness to it. It's uh, it's it's got some uh, resilience, so it's not going to fall apart on you. So if your crust is too dry, it may be a little more delicate than this. Um, but uh, you know, crust is one of those things. A pie crust. It's an intuitive thing. You have to, um, when you're combining your ingredients, you have to do it in such a way that after much experience, you get it exactly the way you want it. Fast question, Mike. Yeah. Are, we, are we putting these in the oven on a like cookie sheet or just in the oven? So you, ideally, you're putting them directly on an oven rack with a, um, with a, a uh, rimmed cookie sheet underneath it so it catches any drippings. So like on the shelf below it, yes. rather than right. sitting it right on the cookie right. sheet. Right. Okay. Um, you'll have it at 350 degrees and it'll be roughly about 40 minutes or so. You'll want to check it after 30 and see okay. where you are. And we're um, going for what temperature now again? 350. No, I mean the oh, interior. Oh, the interior. So you will check the temperature, you want the temperature to be 165, which is the safe zone for chicken. If your chicken is fully cooked, you don't have to worry about that so much. Um, but I cook my chicken so that it's not quite there. It's about 160, it's a little bit pink. And that way I know that I'm not overcooking the chicken. Because I want that chicken to be really okay. soft and succulent. Oh, wow. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Are you going to try it? Show it how it is. <laughs> oh, my God, that's good. Hmm. And I like it with the red bell pepper. Yeah, red bell pepper is nice. Wow. Okay, so. Where while you have your pies in the oven, we're going to do a, a quick salad dressing. So most of you probably don't make a salad dressing at home, but it is the easiest thing to do. And I just wanted to talk about uh, uh, the principles of making a salad dressing. Basically, it's uh, uh, water or vinegar. It's a mixture that's, that's soluble in water and an oil, and they have to come together as a uh, emulsified mixture. So there has to be an emulsifier in there to, um, to bring it together into a salad dressing. So what I use for emulsifiers, anything with lecithin, which would be like an egg yolk, or you can use mustard. And typically prepared mustard has lecithin in it or egg yolk in it. Um, I make my own prepared mustard at home and I use an egg yolk to bring it together to get it some thickness. So you're gonna get your salad greens. You want your salad greens nice and chilled. So we have a, a spring mix here. Um, and this is just for demo's sake, if you wanna, use another type of lettuce, add whatever vegetables you want to your salad. Really the, the key take home here is the salad dressing. So I'm gonna grab my ingredients. Uh, I have to come around this side and do that. And what kind of dressing are you gonna make? I'm just gonna make a straight up vinegar. Let's put this in that bowl. Okay. I can use that for that. Thank you. Okay. 
So I'm going to add some vinegar. You can add the vinegar of your choice. I'm just going to use what we have here. This is just apple cider vinegar. If you want to use something nicer, use a white wine or a red wine vinegar. We're going to add about a quarter cup or so. And then I'm going to crush some garlic. Kitchen's been empty for almost a year now, so yeah, it's um, forgot the eggs over here. We have um, you know, mustard powder. Yeah, it's okay. Well, we might add some mustard powder just for flavor, uh, but for the purposes of this, we're gonna use makeup. So if you don't have any mustard, and you don't mind using a raw egg. This will not be cooked in the end. It's gonna be a raw egg yolk. These days, we don't have to worry so much about, um, about any disease. There's more, more safety measures now, so you don't have to worry about any infected eggs. I don't worry about it myself. So notice what I'm doing. I'm using my hand and I'm separating the egg through my fingertips, through my fingers. So now I have my, my egg yolk, you can see, just like so. I'm gonna put that in my vinegar. I'm gonna add a little bit of garlic to this. I'm gonna add some pepper. I'm going to add some salt. That's plenty of salt. Once again, this is going to cover uh, the leaves. So you want it to be saltier because you're going to have a very little scant amount of, um, of salad dressing for your salad. Okay. All right. I might add a little bit of Worcestershire to this. Whatever you want to do, it's okay. I'm just going to whisk. You can add some shallots to this if you want to. You can add some mustard to this if you want to. I'm just going to whisk this up. And then I'm going to take the oil of my choice and I'm just going to very slowly as I'm whisking, drop some of this oil in. And that egg, egg yolk is gonna do its work to combine the vinegar with the oil. You can add some herb to this. You can either do it before or after you make your salad dressing, it's up to you. I like to uh, do an overhanded whisking motion. Some people prefer to do an underhanded. So some like tarragon. Your proportion, what's your proportion of oil to like vinegar? Is it like two parts oil to one part vinegar? It's really till you get the right consistency. Okay. So if you're going for, uh, for instance, if you want to make salad dressing that's gonna last you a week or so, uh, you might wanna make a cup of salad dressing and you might just do like about, you might start with about a third of a cup or a, a quarter of a cup of, of uh, vinegar. And then you'll add your oil to that. Okay, okay. great. If anyone's concerned about using raw eggs, um, I just checked, they still sell them. Davidson's brand uh, sells a pasteurized in the shell eggs. Um, you could buy them at Giant Eagle, uh, Walmart, Heinen's. Oh, wow. I've never heard of that. Pasteurized in the shell. Yeah. Oh, pasteurized in the shell. Okay, go ahead and tell them the rest now. 
You can also yeah. buy. How do you get the powdered eggs? That works. Glenn, Glenn was involved in, in designing systems that pasteurized eggs for Davidson's. Who was you were, Glenn? I was, yeah. Yeah. In a past life. You know, another thing I do a lot with salad dressing, because I've been bought bottom salad dressing in a million years, is um especially if I'm making just one serving of, of salad dressing, I use a little mayonnaise and then whisk oil into it and you get a nice consistency that way too without having to use a raw egg. And essentially what we're making here is a mayonnaise. Yeah. So mayonnaise is made with an acid and a fat that's emulsified with egg yolks. And so the herbs that I threw in there are tarragon and chervil, which gives it a really nice French kind of now it flavor. mustard. Now what? So you'll notice that your salad dressing, as you're whisking it, is becoming thicker, it's becoming more of a of a sauce consistency. The more fat you add. And as I said, you can add any kind of fat you like. You can use uh, salad oil. You can use a really good olive oil if you want to. But the key is to add it in small amounts gradually so that that yolk has a chance to absorb it. Or if you're using mustard, prepared mustard, that'll also give you a, an emulsification. Well, we have enough turmeric here to sink a ship, but no dried mustard. That's okay. I understand. I want to dry mustard. <laughs> okay. So can we see what we got here? This is a sauce-like consistency that I got just from adding gradually some oil to an acid with egg yolk. And that gave me a really good consistency. You don't want to add your egg whites to this. Just the yolk. Save the egg white for something else. All right. Taste it. Oh, all the spoons in here. Oh, yeah, they live in that closet. Okay, I was using this one. Salt forward is perfect. Salt forward, you're killing me. Okay, anybody have questions about the salad dressing? It's in the oven. Hello. Is the more you Hello? Yep. What else can I do with the pastry? If you have extra, you mean? Yes. Um, Galette. <laughs> yeah. You can, um, yeah, you can save it for, yeah, you can just make another pie with it if you want. If you want to do like a little, like Danita suggested a galette, if you have a small amount left. You can just take some fruit or a vegetable of your choice. You can roll out your, um, your dough and just lay in some vegetable or fruit and then fold the dough over it, brush it with egg wash and bake it off and you'll have what they call a galette. Oh, okay. So the galette is always kind of open in the center and then has just sort of folded over. Yeah, yeah, I know, how to, I know how to do a galette. And it works really well with apples. So if you mix, like slice up your apples and mix uh -huh. it with a little cinnamon and sugar, a tiny bit of flour, and then um, you know, do the folding over and then put a, a pat of butter in the middle. That's my favorite thing to do with the middle. Okay. So when you're doing your salad, this is uh, one thing that's rather important to me is you don't want to add too much salad dressing. You're going to add a few drops. 
And then you're just gonna combine. What you're going for is your leaves to be, oops, just lightly coated in the dressing. Can you see how dry we've got this? There's no cooling on the bottom. And this is why I suggested using quite a bit of salt in that. You want, you want your dressing to be flavorful. Um, so that when you use a small amount, say in our case, I used about a tablespoon in here, mm -hmm. um, then you'll get plenty of flavor with that small amount of salad dressing. You add whatever you want in there. So what I did is I just julep, like matchstick julienne some carrots, just a bit of carrot, um, slice some cucumbers, and I have this leftover roasted cauliflower from dinner. Uh, Thursday night. Perfect. All right. I'm kind of a salad fiend. A lot of uh, salads. A little more dressing of that. It's all right. Well, okay. Maybe you can dump it from one to the other. That's where I was going. I told you. It's like taking directions. That's one of the things I love about salad is that I always cook extra vegetables for dinner and they just become, you know, core for a salad in a day or two. Right? Okay. So we have prepared pot pies, a little bit of salad. Your, hopefully your pot pies will be out of the oven shortly. And you'll be able to have a good square meal like this. I just, for, for something like a pot pie, which is very complex, I just like to serve it with a little bit of salad. And that rounds it out for me nicely. Have a nice glass of wine or something, whatever you want to drink with it, and you've got this beautiful meal. It could even be romantic. Imagine a pot pie as a romantic dinner. But there it is. Well, as long as it doesn't have a soggy bottom, it has a soggy bottom, it feels the romance. Okay, so, so uh, now I want to open it up to questions since we've completed our tasks here. So if anybody has a question, please, um, I think Maggie, you're going to coordinate this. Let's go ahead and do some Q&A. Oh, okay. So I have a question real quick. If you yeah. do, if you do uh, a crust on the bottom as well as the top, how do you get the crust on the bottom so it doesn't get soggy and the top not burn then? Um, you're actually gonna, you're not gonna have much of a difference between the top and the bottom. Um, if your top crust is nice and golden brown, then your crust on the bottom should also be, depending on your vessel. Now, if you're doing something like this, and which is a really thick vessel, it's gonna be a lot lighter than the top. So um, you can take a knife and you can just sort of push. It's fine. Did you, you mush can, it down? Yes. You can just push it to just see if Let you've got enough color. No, it's not. Just leave it be. <laughs> um, hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm. Okay, any, any other questions? But it, it seems like if you're going to do crust on the bottom, the amount of crust I made was enough for the top, but you probably yeah. want two and a half or so times as much if you want to cover the bottom and sides. Yes, and also you want to roll your crust out a little thinner if oh, you're okay. doing the bottom as well. Okay. Um, it's, in my experience, um, if you have a thick crust on the bottom, it becomes very doughy, gummy. And um, it doesn't have the light, crispy texture that you're after. So I would roll the dough out thinner, which means you would get more mileage out of it. So if you are doing top and bottom crust, I might increase the recipe by another half. Now you told me that you had, a, a, like your dough was, was smaller than you expected. Yeah, it ended up being about the size of a racquetball. Okay. Oh my goodness. Um, so what, you said you, you halved your recipe, right? 
Yeah, I, I did a cup and a quarter of flour. Okay. And that's what, that's what I did. And I okay. got these three out of that. All right. Well, you must have rolled this, it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> could be. Could be. I rolled it to about one eighth of an inch thick. Okay. Yeah, I, I had enough to cover the three tops, but I wouldn't have had enough to cover the bottoms too. Right, right. So if you want to do bottoms, we didn't talk about, we really didn't talk about that in the beginning, but if you wanted to do a, like an all around crust, right. you do have to, I mean, I would say to one and a half times the recipe or double the recipe. Okay. And you'll have a little bit left over probably. Which is fine. Okay. Um, any, anybody else? Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to have to pay extra because I've had the most questions. Um, <laughs> my chicken, whenever I fix chicken, well, my family says that I fix R and R chicken. It's either raw or rubbery. And <laughs> what am I doing wrong? All right. Now, this is where it's really useful to have a probe thermometer handy. And I have an electronic probe thermometer that I'm just always, it's always with me, except today for some reason. I usually have it with me, but uh, not today. Uh, and that's a good way to check the temperatures of things. And chefs habitually check internal temperatures because really it's, it's a liability issue for us if uh, something is undercooked, like chicken. Um, and also what could be, if you're getting a rubbery texture, you might be cooking your chicken at too high of a heat. Mm. So um, when you cook something at too high of a heat, it can, uh, like chicken, which has to be cooked all the way through, it can end up overcooking. And you are stressing out the proteins by cooking it too high. If it's a steak, that's a different story, right? Because a steak, we, cut, we, we don't want to cook it all the way through. We want it to be medium or medium rare or a good restaurant quality steak. So really all we're doing is cooking the outside to that uh, crispy texture. And that is high heat cooking. Chicken, um, in this case, what I did was I just cooked it at high heat to get a crust on the outside. And then I cooked it at a nice gentle low heat to cook it all the way through. And that gave us a really tender texture. Would you say it's pretty tender, right? Oh yeah, very. I mean, you could cut it with a fork. You could squish it, it was very like soft. Mm. And when it's in a pot pie like this, you want a tender chicken. Um, yeah. Well, I did so, rubbery. Okay. So my, uh, can, I, can, try can I add a comment about chicken? I just found a, a little um, trick that I found, and I hate to say that I use this, but I microwave the chicken first. That seems to cook the inside and gets it up to a good enough temperature so that I can cook the outside at a higher heat and the inside is then safe and it stays yeah. that way. Mm. Oh, I figured it when I microwave it, like it was <laughs> elastic. Uh, I yeah. think maybe my, I need a new thermometer because, you know, I kept saying mine's only at a hundred, it's only 120. Well, while you were going on, I took mine out, even though it said 140, and it was overdone. So it must be I need another thermometer. Um, it also could be that you're, that you, did you cook it and did you poach it or did you just? No, I was trying to poach it. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> your poaching liquid could have been too hot. Uh... Um, that's another thing. You want to check the temperature of the poaching liquid as well. You don't want that poaching liquid to get above 180. Okay. So it's just going to be like maybe barely, barely bubbling to the surface. And in fact, a really good poach, you're not seeing any surface disturb, dis, uh, dis, uh, you're not going to see a disturbed surface at all. It's going to be not bubbling. Okay. Um, that when it's at 180, it's really not, not boiling or not simmering. It's just hot and it's above the temperature of the safe zone for the chicken, but not way above. Okay. Um, and your probe thermometer, a good way to check it is to put it into boiling water or put it oh. in, a, in or put it in a frozen or just barely frozen liquid, ice water. Okay, so 
So last night, Joe jo and Mike and I had dinner together. We, we cooked Chinese food at home. And we cooked rice, like we usually cook what rice, and then just put four raw chicken thighs on top. And when the rice was done in 20 minutes, the chicken was done. And it was amazingly tender. Yeah. So why is that? Because it seems like that was at a temperature higher than 180, and yet it was amazingly tender and juicy and like just right. Because that recipe um, was tested, and the, <laughs> the the cooking temperature and the time for rice works out to be the same temperature as the chicken to, or to cook the chicken. So um, she had probably done a test to see if they would cook well together. And that even might have been some ancient Chinese <laughs> recipe, right? They've done it many, many times, and they know that it works out. Because otherwise, you'd have to test it. Well, no matter what the temperature is, no matter what the temperature is under the rice, the steam coming off the rice is it boiling. Yeah, so it's, it's consistent. You're steaming the chicken. Right. And yeah. so it's the, the time the time it takes to cook that amount of rice and the time it takes to cook the chicken are the same. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you're saying is you're not out of breath. <laughs> right. You can do a test and you could just, you know, you can do a timetable and, and you know, do a controlled test. But that recipe had been tested over and over. So, so yeah, my advice is get a really good probe thermometer. You can get really good InstaRead thermometers that are electronic and they give you a really good uh, uh, instant readout. They're very accurate. Okay. So yeah, I'm sorry that you're having trouble with chicken. I, I hear this a lot where people say that they can't get their proteins right. And it often has to do with temperature. Mm. Uh, they're just, maybe turning the heat up too high and getting unsatisfactory results. So yeah. the, the main complaint is my chicken's too dry and my chicken's overdone. Um, and that's really a matter of monitoring it and, and really obsessively taking its temperature. Okay. Once you get over the 165 mark, it's getting tougher and tougher and drier and drier. Yeah, yeah. that's my chicken. There you go. <laughs> So get yourself a good thermometer. You're set to go. Any other questions? Denise, you said this is a like a question, like this this would be a, a, a robust question and answer period. Period. <laughs> yes. Normally this is a group of people who have a lot of questions and a lot of answers. <laughs> so how do you not grate your knuckles when you're grating the butter on the grater? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Liz. <laughs> uh, um, <Ask> the nurse. <laughs> so uh, that that could be that you want your butter to be cold. Make yep. sure your butter is really cold. In fact, yep. put the butter in the freezer. Okay. Um, yeah. Put the butter in the freezer about an hour before you're going to grate it. No more than an hour. And that'll get it more solid. Um, and then... Watch your knuckles. <laughs> uh, I thought maybe there was yeah, a magic one of those things takes practice. Yeah. But if you're using butter, you know, if you got butter on this, um, yeah, you can always, these are, can be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So in the same category, the one thing you did, Mike, that truly alarmed me was the way you cut the onions. Okay. The like, Circular motion, you know, and, yeah. and I'm, my knife is not as sharp as his knife, and I'm just gonna whack my knuckle and or, yeah. yeah. And so if if my general approach to onions is, you know, chop off the ends, peel it off, and then just like take my nice knife and go chop 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 if your if your knife skills are are really good when they're approaching that, then um, you want controlled cuts more than chaos. 
Uh -huh. So when you're chopping like this, yeah. I call that a chopped onion. It's a, it's more chaotic. Yeah. You don't see that for, uh, you know, for product that's going to be evenly sized. You're going to end up with a rough that's cut. Nice. You're going to have some bigger pieces and smaller pieces. Now we do that with garlic because we're just going after it and constantly chopping it. But you might even see in a, in a professional kitchen, they're still doing the controlled cuts. They're taking their garlic and they're slicing it lengthwise and then they're chopping mm -hmm. and they're getting a fine texture that way. And that's the end of it. They're not doing this. Yeah. So um, also with onions, they weep and they give you the, you know, the vapor that, that can cause you to cry. I'm really sensitive to onions myself. So the quicker I can get it over with, the better. Yeah. So if I'm doing controlled cuts, I'm getting it over with fast. Okay. How often do you cut the I cut onion? Yeah. So I always cut the root end, you know, the hairy end off, and then stand it up that flat, cut side down, cut it vertically, then lay it down flat, and then kind of cut so that it's like a 30 degree angle, a 60 degree angle, a 90 degree angle around, but not going all the way through. So you're radiating. It's right, you're radiating. You're like radiating that way. And then, yeah, that's another right. way. And I get a really nice dice now. Yeah, that's another way to do it. Because honestly, like I see you do this, I've seen you do it a million times, and it freaks me out. Yeah, I'm going to get freaked out. It's like if you were my mother, you would have cut your hands off 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, some people don't even do this, they just do the the lengthwise cuts over the top and then they just chop it. Yeah. Because they'll use the layers of the onion to work as exactly. So that's, and that's again, um, you'll get a larger product that way. It won't be quite as fine. So if you're going for a fine dice, we'll do this and this. But if you're going for a medium or large dice, then just do it this way and then that way. And you'll get a pretty good medium to large dice. There you go. Yep. And the radio works. But I have a hard time doing this, I just, I'm not comfortable doing it that way. I like vertical cuts or, I know. <laughs> like every time I see somebody use a, um, a mandolin, oh, yeah. I'm always sure they're just gonna like slice their hand, like shear a whole chunk of their hand off. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing, it takes practice. And some people have had accidents, I, I know, yeah. So, um, anyone else? What's for dessert? <laughs> What's for dessert? I know, right? I was saying we should do a dessert. Yeah, maybe, maybe for like a chocolate night or something. <laughs> See, Liz has all the good ideas. I do. Go. I do. <laughs> I'm all about the chocolate. I can tell you right now is my. Smells amazing, and I just turned on the light and looked in the oven, and I've got a little bit of boil coming out of the edges, and it just looks like it's really close to done. Excellent, excellent. I hope you guys all managed to post some pictures of, of your final products, because I want to see what they all look like. Is there, a place <laughs> is there a place we can put them? I don't know, is that, that a question for Maggie? Can we put them on East Shore? Put them on East Shore's <laughs> website? Oh, Friends of East Shore, Facebook page. Facebook page? Yeah, that's the best place to do it because anybody can, you know, if you're a member of that group, you can post. Cool. Yeah, because I want to see. Very curious. And joining that group is easy, so. Did anybody do a, a large pot pie instead of individual portions? And Yes. Yeah, you did? Yep. Okay, how big did you go? Was it like like this? There, I'll show you. I don't know when it's going to work so small. Kind of that big. Oh, beautiful. Oh, oh wow. Look at that. Wow. Beautiful. Gorgeous. That's like a lasagna pan. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> I'm giving it to my daughter. She's moving in a couple days and she's got a big family. So. Oh my goodness. So there's a ramekin one. I can share oh, mine. So yeah, Mary only cooks for thousands. <laughs> <laughs> and, and ah. 
what I did with my extra pie crust is I brushed it with egg wash, sprinkled it with cinnamon sugar, cut it into strips, and baked it with the I, I've already eaten it. It was delicious. Oh, oh, it makes me think about when I was a little kid. That's how things went in my house when we what we used to call pie crust cookies. So right, yeah, right. Yeah. My mom always did with extra pie crust. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about this recipe is that it's a cross between a puff pastry and a, and a regular pie crust pastry. So it's got the flaky layers um, that you can just brush with something. You can brush it with butter and the cinnamon and sugar and just bake it off and you're going to get a pretty good beautiful result. Napoleon. It'd be just gorgeous for that. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. So even this, when it's cooled off, it's still pretty flaky, right? Oh, it's yeah. not, um, yeah. It's very flaky. Lovely. This is stupid delicious, and I can't believe how much I love the red peppers in here. <laughs> like seriously, like I don't think of like frozen red peppers as having any value on Earth. Those were fresh red peppers. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just threw in some fresh red pepper because I had, and I wanted some color in there. Like this is a good illustration of, you know, you can use any vegetable you want. Obviously, somebody wanted to use. Uh, asparagus, that's a great alternative. You could put mushrooms in there and you can really personalize this and make it the way you want. So this is why, um, you know, this works out for cooking. Maybe it's towards the end of your shopping cycle where you're running out of stuff <laughs> and you can bake things into a pie and then you've got dinner. You could use Vegetables that you've got frozen in the, you know, frozen, and you can use whatever you've got in the pantry and throw it together, and there it is. Yep. And if you roast a chicken one night, yeah, you can always use the leftovers the next night to make a hot pot. Right, and as I said, you can also pick up a roasted, whole roasted chicken. Just use the meat for the, from the roasted chicken if you don't want to bother with cooking a chicken. So could you eat this with like, I don't know, like lamb or sausage or something like that? I, I suppose so, I've never done it, but yeah. I mean, you would change up the sauce maybe and maybe the vegetables, but yeah, I don't see why not. I make it out of hamburger a lot for the grandkids. They love it. They oh, really? It. So do you, you- The beef broth instead of using a chicken broth and, and pretty much do the same thing. Okay. Just yeah, like, you put some vegetables in it? Yeah. What I made tonight has an awful lot of corn and green beans and carrots in it because, mm -hmm. you know, there's six kids all the number. So those are the kind of vegetables they like. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like, it's, I, you know, like if I were to do this another time, I might put some mushrooms in it. I just kind of give it a more earthy, deeper flavor that would add to it in my opinion. I'm dying to make this with um, like baked cube tofu and coconut milk and coconut oil and curry. And the curry one is amazing. If you wanna do curry, uh, you would make, a, like it's basically the recipe that I put out here is like a Thai curry with coconut milk. Mm -hmm. um, and you can add a little bit of vegetable uh, vegetable stock with that and then add some curry spices and it's beautiful it's really rich and flavorful um, with the butternut squash and, and other vegetables it's really really nice it's a very good alternative so we actually made the Thai curry one tonight we split the stuff up the vegetables and we did yep. one chicken and i have one with no meat but the thai curry did you taste the sauce before it you is added? it is delicious yeah and yeah. And yeah the curry is it's great and it's I, really good if you're not using chicken because it gives it more depth of flavor it's really really delicious we added some potatoes and sweet potatoes because i like the peas and potato mix mm -hmm. So, you know, we, with this dinner last night, we had the, the craziest thing that made no sense to me. Silk, cold silken tofu cut into slices and then just sort of like laid down and then fresh avocado cut into slices the same way and laid down over it. And then just pour a really simple dressing of, what was it? Soy sauce, a bit of water, sesame oil and garlic. 
and that was it. This is avocado food. And yeah. it was cold, like silken tofu and avocado. It was who'd have known? It was amazing. That was delicious. Yeah. I've yeah. never eaten silken tofu like that before. Asian cooking. If you if you ever want to do some really good Asian cooking, I picked up a book called Every Grain of Rice. I highly recommend it if you want to do good uh, rustic countryside Chinese cooking. And there's so much vegan and vegetarian in there. It's ridiculous. Not as much meat. Um, it's yeah, brilliant. If you if you want to do really good authentic Chinese cooking, every grain of rice. Fuchsia Dunlop. If, That's if the name I, of the author. If it's I were to do this dish vegetarian, do it vegan, I would use soy curls rather than tofu. It's a shredded, dried tofu that you reconstitute, and it has a nice flavor to substitute for chicken in a, a sauce like this. It it's a really good idea. Do you have to do anything to it? No, no. I mean, you... You rehydrate it, you squeeze the water out of it, and then you would just add it in with the sauce. You can brown okay. it. You can brown it the same way that you do the chicken in the way the recipe was printed. Um, you could even put it in with the aromatics and, and brown it that way. But even just squeezing the water out and putting it in the sauce would give it a, it has a nice texture for yeah. substituting. It's almost like uh, pieces of chicken. So, right. Oh, wow. I've never good. tried that product before. I got to give that a whirl. Yeah, it's just, it's just um, tofu, but it's a different texture because it's been dried and, and shredded into bigger pieces. So, is it fully dried or is it like a jerky? Dry. It's completely dry. Okay. It's, if you tried, you could crumble it. You know, you okay. could. Wow. Oh, it takes wow. some, take some effort. But you could crumble it. And where would you find a product like that? I get it from Amazon, but I think Whole Foods may carry it. Um, okay. But nowadays, everything is delivered here, or I pick it up. Right. Buy it. I get it from Amazon. Right. Right. Okay. This is really so. Good. Anybody else? You want anybody else have a topic that they want to explore? All I wanted to say was I'm eating my pot pie. It's great. <laughs> Are you eating it? Yep. Too. All right. Good job. We have right. a good. Everybody, good you guys. Go show your pot pies. We want to see them all. Let's have a whole. <laughs> yeah, let's see them. <laughs> it didn't even occur to me until about ten minutes ago that I could put the pot pies into the regular oven and not. Gallery. The oven. <laughs> of pot pies. Wait, here we go. Nice. There's oh, like. Wow. Woo <laughs> good. Well, there's like practice, medium, and okay. There's <laughs> why they turn out like <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it is like putting these things together and making them look polished. It can take some practice. Yeah. Um, if you want to, it's, you know, it's making pastry. It's not, um, it's, it's not going to be perfect the very first time you do it. Don't feel like it has to be you know, a, a perfect turned out product. Uh, I've been doing this for many, many years. I mean, I got my culinary degree in 2006. So, uh, you know, I've been working in bakeries and restaurants since and um, lots of practice. Same for me, <laughs> decades. Yeah, oh good, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I wanted to thank you guys for um, for, for tonight, I had a really nice time. It was great to meet you all. Thank you. And, yeah. Uh, Thank you. It was fun. Yeah, I, I hope that you do this again. And um, and at some point, you might want to do these and freeze them and, and bake them off when you want them. This is what, like one of the beauty of this of this kind of thing is that you can pull it out of the freezer and just heat it up in the oven when you don't really want to cook. And you've got something really beautiful. In fact, I made these for my sister when she was pregnant with twins. Actually, she had just given birth to her twins. And I made, I don't know, 30 or so individual pot pies that they could stuff in their chest freezer. Um, that they could just pull out, among other things that I made. So they could just pull out and eat when they didn't have time to cook. And she, 
you know, a year later, she was saying she was pulling out some of these boxes <laughs> in the freezer. <laughs> So, uh, freezer burn much? No, it lasts for a year. Freezer can hold it for a year. It's amazing. You wrap it well. So it would be really cool to do this again. Okay. Yeah. Do mm -hmm. it. I, I had a surprisingly good time. I thought it was just going to be like running around. Yeah. You know? No, it was great. You guys are great teachers. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. It was, yeah, I, it was really that was wonderful. Yep. Good. Now, let's all keep our fingers and toes crossed that the recording came out. Yep. Y yes. <laughs> Do keep your fingers and toes crossed. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and for those of you who are familiar with the East Shore Kitchen, it's really clean. <laughs> that's the favorite part about doing this today. Like while well, Mike was prepping, I was cleaning. Oh my gosh, that's that range is yeah, like the, new. This the stoves and the hood look brand new. Yeah. Yeah. It was a pleasure working in this kitchen. I love working in this kitchen. I suppose I talk about my husband too often, but my husband's the one that designed the kitchen and ordered all the appliances and stuff. So yeah. Did a great job. It's a beautiful kitchen. It works well. Yeah, it really is helpful. Yep. Have a good kitchen. It has a nice flow. <clears throat> and I don't think you talk about him too much at all. Thank you. I don't That's think good. so either. <laughs> okay. I nope, love him. All right. If there are any more questions? I think we're good to go. What do you think, Maggie? I think this is a great evening. I'm glad we got it recorded. And thank you, Mike. Thank you, Denise. Woohoo! Yes. All right. Yay. Okay. Bye-bye, okay. 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 everybody. Thank Thanks. you so All much. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Yeah, yeah. It was fun. Uh, thank you. It was wonderful. This was great. <laughs>